had papers recently on um, linear algebra and on matrices and on how complex systems fail and about people. But for once, we've got this classic uh, concept around uh, type theory and category theory, and it's got closely in the name. So uh, uh, this, I feel like we're really living up to a stereotype this time. So uh, please, everyone, give a very warm welcome to Ollie Charles and his. Uh, <laughs> Okay, uh, hi everyone. So yeah, it's really good to be talking about what is probably one of my all-time favourite uh, functional programming papers. But to call it a paper, I guess, is a little sneaky because technically it's a preprint and it never actually made it to a journal or a conference. But um, it's still been quite widely cited and stuff. So yeah, I'm happy calling it my uh, favourite paper. And before I kind of go into the paper at all, I think it might be interesting to explore the story of how I actually found out about this paper. So about five, maybe six years ago, I was working for a non-profit organization called Music Brains, which is a little bit like Wikipedia in that it's a public database, a collaborative effort from everybody to edit metadata about musicians. So artists, uh, albums they produce, the tracks they've released, and their roles on the track and so on. Uh, and at the time, we were trying to work out how to get a read-only database in place for this system. So it's a Postgres master database, and we had a couple of reasons why we needed to kind of take that down into a read-only mode while we did maintenance on the master. And at the time, Music Brains was written in Perl. So making this transition from an application that just assumed that it could always write to the database to an application where it had to now check the state of the database was a rather kind of laborious and ad hoc task and extremely error-prone. Uh, so we kind of went through the source code, grepping and using my kind of mental model of the system, and we thought we caught most of the places where it was assuming that it could write to a database. And then the very first time we went down into maintenance mode, my inbox immediately filled up with stack trace reports of everywhere where it was trying to write to the database, and of course, it couldn't be because it's in read only. And this was in places where I really had no idea this was even going to happen, such as when you log into the system, we implement a uh, timestamp on your user account to work out if accounts are active or inactive, and I had no idea to even consider that this was somewhere where I'd need to look at the state of the database. Uh, but in tandem to this, I was also learning Haskell at the same time, and I was starting to see the benefits of having a really nice type system for reasoning about code. So I'd seen how if you've got this kind of really nice pure setting, if the pieces fit together in type check, then generally it would do the right thing. So the types would have to rule out large classes of bugs. But all of the examples of type safety I've seen seemed a little bit kind of trivial. They were, you know, you could avoid null pointer exceptions and things like that, which was great, but the really hard problems I found in my day job was things like dealing with the database state, and I wanted to know if I could get the types to help me make these kind of decisions and correct those properties. Um, so I came across this paper called Plessy Hours of Outrageous Fortune by Conor McBride, which seemed to be exactly what I was looking for. It's taken me many read-throughs over the years to really extract the knowledge I need from this paper. It's, it's full of a lot of different concepts, which is also kind of why it's one of my favorite papers. So in terms of the concepts that are delivered in the paper, that it kind of marries so many different fields of research together really nicely into one paper. So there's obviously functional programming. The paper itself is, is a Haskell paper um, written using the Strathclyde and Haskell Enhancement Suite which is a preprocessor on Haskell, but for the most part it's a Haskell paper. But we also have propositions as types, which is the idea that the type system can be used as a way to prove logical statements. And this is an area that's uh, explored a little bit more by people like Philip Wadler. Uh, but yeah, the idea here is that types now start to encode logical statements, and the programs under these types are proofs that the logical statements hold. There's an awful lot of category theory in the paper as well. Um, we're going to see ideas borrowed such as well, the notion of a category, the notion of functors and monads, but recast in a slightly different setting than we've seen in Haskell so far, um, a setting that gives them more rigor and um, the ability to carry kind of formal verification. And there's a lot of formal verification in the paper. It draws upon ideas all the way back from the early 1970s when we were starting to learn how to reason about programs. Uh, and there's a type of reasoning called poor logic which was mostly designed around mutable data structures. But interestingly, the ideas there carry forward into this setting, and we can use the same ideas to prove properties about our functional programs. Uh, there's dependent types in the paper, and 
a lot of people kind of see Haskell and think, oh, this language would be great if only we had dependent types. But in fact, Haskell almost does have everything about dependent types already in it. You just have to do a little bit more work to kind of get that power out of the language. And finally, there's a, a lot of generic programming in the paper. So this seems to be kind of one of Connor's uh, big interests is generic programming and doing as little work as possible to actually get programs written. So we're going to see some generic programming techniques that let us do as little work as possible. And finally, uh, this point about higher rank quantification is really more a point that it explores some very uh, sophisticated techniques of functional programming that at the time I was aware Haskell could do these things, but I'd never seen them used in the setting to kind of do useful work. So um, I'll now dive in with the paper. The paper starts with a uh, kind of motivation, uh, motivating problem. And it's written in a C-like language, but I've recast it here in Haskell because I think it's going to be easier if we just stick with one language. And the program that we start with is, is really quite a straightforward program. We open a foo.txt file in read mode, and once that file is open, we then read the contents as a string. To read the contents, we simply get one character at a time. And I'm assuming here we've got some f get c function that will return maybe a character. It won't return a character if we're at the end of the file. So we read a character, if we did read it, then we carry on reading the rest of the file and we build up a list of all the characters that we read and we return that. And when we reach the end of the file, we hit the base case of our recursion and we return the empty string. Really straightforward program, it seems. Unfortunately, it's written with bugs. Uh, right on the first line here, we're already making the assumption that foo.txt exists, that we can open it with uh, read access, uh, that it's not a directory or anything like that. And not only are we making that assumption, the rest of our program is encoding the assumption that all of these operations are going to preserve the state of the file handle. Uh, f get c isn't going to close the file handle, um, and as we enter the loop repeatedly, the file handle will remain open. So we know these things, or we'd like to think we know these things, but the compiler has no idea about this stuff, which means the compiler is now unable to help us make sure we get this program correct. Uh, and finally, there's another bug. This line down here is quite a subtle one, but if we can imagine if this was running in some sort of long-running server process, closing file handles is extremely important because file handles are a really scarce resource on servers, so you definitely don't want to end up leaking file handles. But I could remove that line, and absolutely nothing would happen when I compile this. It will carry on running just as it did before, but it will now start to leak resources. <coughs> so what we're trying to do in this paper is work out how we can get the type system to prevent all of those problems that I've just mentioned. And to kind of think out loud about what we need here, crucially we were lacking two pieces of information, and that's the idea of preconditions and postconditions on every one of those operations. So the preconditions encode our kind of assumptions when we run the command. The precondition for fopen is probably that we started with the file closed, and then a precondition for getting a character is that the file handle is actually successfully open. Uh, kind of dual to that is postconditions. We want to encode what happens as the program progresses and how the state transforms over time. So our precondition for fopen was that we started in a closed state. The postcondition is that we will end up in probably some unknown state because we don't actually know if opening a file will work or not. However, for things like fgetc, our postcondition is that we didn't change the state of the file handle. If it was open in the first place, it will be open after we read a character. And we'd also like an algebra to combine this data together. Uh, functional programming is all about composing <coughs> small programs together to build a larger program. So I still want to have that property in my slightly more rigorous setting. I want to be able to build small programs and then compose these together in a way that I can locally reason about the individual parts. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we want a notion of uncertainty. So with fopen, we don't know what the state is going to be. That really does depend on when we run the, ro well, when we run the program and uh, if foo.txt exists and so on. So we need to be able to encode that uncertainty into our program and make sure that we deal with whatever the world happens to throw at us. So to start with, uh, let's just try and capture the possible states of the system. <coughs> and for our little kind of domain-specific language that we'll end up building, there are really only two possible states. Either the file was successfully open or the file handle is in a closed state. And what we're doing here by encoding states, actually, is already beginning to see how these different fields begin to combine together. 
Uh, in Haskell, um, and more generally in, in well-typed functional programming, as I said before, uh, types can correspond to logical statements. And that's for a correspondence that's fairly well known and well studied, known as the curry howard correspondence. So under this correspondence, types encode logical statements, and the programs that we write that have these types encode proofs that these logical statements do hold. Uh, I'm using an extension here called DataKinds, which is uh, an extension that came to GHC 7.6, I think. And essentially, it lifts this data type up one level. So rather than have open and closed as being kind of runtime values, there are actually going to be types we can use inside our program. And this also is how we can start to use kind of dependently typed programming techniques. Uh, and that'll be a bit more apparent as we go on. I think. So now that we've got our possible states we could be in, we can begin to write data types that are parameterized over the possible file handle states. Um, and these data types are generally known as being witnesses to the potential file handle states you could be in. Here I've got a, a, a general witness, which is parameterized over any file handle state, and we have two possible ways of constructing it. I can witness that the file handle state is in an open state, and that's where I'm using this open type here. Or I can witness that the file handle is in a closed state, and likewise I use closed over there. And the structure that we're actually working with here in Haskell is a generalized algebraic data type, which lets us refine this type variable here in each of the two constructors. Uh, and what that means is now when I start to pattern match on this data, I'll learn more information about the program as we go on. Uh, and generally, these <coughs> state index data types can be seen as predicates on file handle states. And for every type of data that we actually have, like if I have a witness open value, then that is a witness that the predicate holds at a given state. So another type of state index data type that we can have is one that's a little bit more specific. Uh, this one is, again, parameterized by S2, a set of file handle states. But we also give it another file handle state. And what we're going to use this witness to do is to declare the state that we expect to be in. So the only way to construct this is by having both of these types be exactly the same type. Uh, so we're going to use this as a kind of equality trick as we go on later. Uh, and it's going to be more apparent why this is useful. Um, but for example, if we're given a value that witnesses a string in the closed state, then when we pattern match on this, we're going to learn that this type variable s, which was previously unknown, must be closed. Because the only way to construct the data type is if both of the types match up. So we're starting to see these state index data types and these predicates. So the next question is, what can we actually do with them? So functional programming is really all about functions. So an obvious starting point would be, what are the functions between these data types? Uh, and perhaps a straightforward idea is, functions of our state index data types simply preserve the state. They're not allowed to look at the state. They have to work for whatever state you're in. And we can encode this in Haskell with just a type alias. Here we have a normal Haskell function over two state index data types A and B. And we use a quantification here that says this function has to hold whatever state we choose to run the function in. And that means that the only thing that this function can do is basically pass that state through exactly as it was. It doesn't have the ability to inspect the state, nor does it have the ability to choose what the state is going to be. And we already have a couple of functions that satisfy this type right in the Haskell preload. The identity function ordinarily takes any type A and gives you it straight back. But if I specialize type A to be some data type X parameterized by state and substitute that in, we end up with one of these state-preserving functions. Uh, I simply substitute for A, X state, and I get for all state, X state to X state, and that is exactly the type alias that we just built before. We also have composition. We can play the same trick there. Now, if I simply substitute in three different types, x, y, and z, that are all parameterized over state, then when I substitute in, with a little bit of rearrangement, I also get the same formulation. I can now compose my state index functions, and it does what I think you would expect it to do, which is just preserve state all the way through the composition. So that might seem like a kind of cute trick, but it actually points out something far more important, which is we're now working with a category. We have all the data we need for a category. Our objects are uh, our state index data types. Our functions between them are state preserving functions. We have a notion of identity, and we have a notion of composition. So we do have all the data we need for a category. 
And the reason this is exciting is because category theory, now knowing we have a category, opens up all the category theory to borrow many more concepts and see just how far we can take this idea. And the category that we've actually kind of stumbled across here is a well-studied type of category, which is known as a slice category. Generally speaking, slice categories work over a large category of objects, and you take one particular object that you're going to slice over, and then all objects in the slice category are uh, basically objects that are indexed by that type, which is exactly what we've seen with data types that were indexed by file handle states. So, Knowing that we've got a category then, let's stay, see if we can start to steal some ideas. Uh, Haskell has uh, the notion of a functor, which uh, anybody who's used Haskell for a small amount of time has probably come across. And generally a functor lets you move between two different categories, but the functor in Haskell is a little bit restrictive uh, in the categories you can move between. So we're going to invent our own type of functor here, which we're going to call an I functor. And this now is actually using our state-preserving functions to map between. Other than map, it's the same idea as fmap, but now if you give me any functor that's going to be indexed by some state, then I can map between using my state preserving arrows. And to give a concrete example of that, uh, we could have uh, our file handle states for single files, but we could have a functor which is a vector of files. So now I have a vector of open files, and that's going to be indexed by a vector of file handle states. And what F, uh, IMAP is doing is saying, if you give me a function that works on one file handle, then I can IMAP that over a vector of file handles, and um, it will have the, the kind of obvious interpretation of working on every file in that vector. So, to me, that's now getting quite exciting. We've got a, an abstraction that actually happens to have a, a kind of practical sense, as we saw with uh, mapping over vectors of file handles and so on. So I wonder if there are any more concepts that we can borrow. Um, again, another very common abstraction in Haskell is that of a monad, which we use for sequencing things together. Um, perhaps the most widely used is the IO monad, which we're going to use to actually sequence operations that interact with the outside world. So I wonder if our notion of state index data types also has a correspondence with monads. Well, it does, but it's a slightly different rearrangement um, than just simply substituting the arrows in before. You, you basically are substituting the arrows, we have to flip these data types around just to kind of get things to line up. But, um, so a, an indexed monad, or a, a, this I monad type, works over any state index functor, and we have the ability to return into the monad, which is just like return for an ordinary Haskell monad, and we have the ability to extend the computation. So that if you give me any monadic computation of, that's going to return the type A, then I can extend that with another monadic computation. But something interesting is actually happening here, uh, and it's right in this Holly, is function that here. Oh, yeah. yes. hmm? The arrow in the middle is it meant to have a missing? That, that one is meant to be missing. Uh, yeah. Sorry, just that one, yeah. yeah. Uh, I've tried to kind of come up with an explanation of why that is, but it's, it's quite tricky okay. <laughs> to do so. Um, but essentially, like each kind of part of this is, is part of the encoding of what it means to be a monad. I've, this is kind of more an implementation detail of the fact that we're writing it. Uh, so this I extend type warrants uh, a deeper inspection because it actually deals with a notion of uncertainty already, even though we didn't anticipate that perhaps. And we can see this if we expand this uh, state indexed arrow type and actually expand it out to its full definition. So first of all, we'll expand this one on the right hand side. So we need to introduce some sort of quantification over state, which I'll call state 1. <coughs> and now we have MA indexed by state 1, and that's going to go to MB indexed by state 1. But we've still got a state-preserving function over here. So now if I expand that one, we have to introduce another level of quantification. So we can't reuse the same state 1, because, because this is uh, in parenthesis and is, an, is an actual function, we have to introduce more quantification. But what we actually end up doing is introducing a higher rank of quantification. So um, ranks of quantification is a little bit of a, a weird scenario, um, but a nice way of understanding it is kind of like playing a game. Uh, when you have rank 1 quantification, when you call a function, you get to decide what the types are going to be. However, with rank 2 quantification, you don't get to decide what the types are going to be. The person who's using the function gets to decide what the types are going to be. So it kind of flips back and forth as you go up this hierarchy of, uh, of higher rank quantification. 
And that means that if I use I extend, I have the ability to choose this state one. I can decide what state I start in. However, when I want to actually extend the computation, I don't get to choose what the state is. And if we flip back to the uh, original example all the way back at the start, that notion there is here you're kind of seeing the I extend thing. I get to choose the state I'm in when I call F open. It might not type check, but I can still choose what it is. However, this con uh, continuation, I don't get to choose what state I'm in. So now we're starting to see this notion of uncertainty in how we have to deal with whatever the world happens to throw at us. So there are times, however, when we do know what, we're gonna, what state we're going to end up in. For example, reading a character from a file, we know that that doesn't change the state of the file handle. So it's a little awkward if we have to potentially deal with any state because we know that you really will only end up in one state. Um, and we can do that by introducing what chronicles the notion of uh, angelic binding. Uh, and to get angelic binding, we reuse this witness data type that we introduced earlier, which gave us that notion of equality between file handle states. So uh, we can assume here that we've got an action M, which begins in state A, and it returns, when the computation succeeds, a witness containing a boolean, but also a witness that the index state is going to be state B. And we also have this action 2 here, which is a function that takes booleans and expects to be in state B uh, and can return a character. So with angelic binding, we actually get the ability to combine these two together. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't put the definition here, which maybe would have been useful. Uh, but what happens is when we extend this computation, we can pattern match on the witness, which is going to teach us that this uh, state 2 is whatever we witnessed, which in this case is uh, state B. Sorry, that's a little all over the place there, but the, uh, the idea is as you extend the computation, you pattern match on the witness, which is going to refine the type variables in the equation in order for you to know that you're actually going to be in this state that you witnessed earlier. Uh, and this is in contrast, oh, sorry, on. states you've got with capital S there in the previous slides that were uh, so in this, this is just talking about the general shape of what it means to be an index monad. Right. Here I wanted to just consider a kind of concrete example of things you might actually happen to have and you want to take like, so There is a state. There is a state, <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, and so this is in contrast to demonic binding, as Connor calls it, which is actually what we've already seen by I extend. And it comes out a little bit messy, but this now has the same shape as a normal Haskell bind operation. You start with a manual computation, and then your continuation is to the right of that. So that lets us bind things together. But it's demonic in the sense that we don't know what state we're going to end up in. So we still have one of the state preserving functions here. Uh, and the higher rank quantification means we have to deal with whatever the world throws at us. So that's probably a lot of theory to throw at everyone for now. So, uh, but fortunately, that's basically all the theory we need to start assembling a kit to build a domain specific language for reading files. <coughs> So the first thing that Connor does is introduce this uh, pairing up of a witness and also a continuation that can be ran assuming that you are in that witness state. Uh, so there's quite a lot of type variables going on here, but we're able to parameterize over any witness type. And A is the argument to the continuation, and B is what the continuation will return. And all of this gets parameterized over some state. Uh, and this is, a, this is an I functor. Um, very much like kind of functions in Haskell are functors. You can map over the result of a function call. We can IMAP over one of these by simply doing uh, post composition on this function. So if you give me a function from B to C, then I can IMAP that over this by composing A to B with B to C to go A to C. It's clearly a function because composition is a function. Right, yeah. Um, and each of these actually, uh, to give you a kind of intuition for what this type of thing means, is I like to think of it as a kind of partially applied instruction in a domain specific language. So um, all of this encodes the instruction, and when I call it partially applied, this is what needs to happen with the result of the function. So opening a file handle, in your continuation you get to decide what you're going to do with the file handle. When you read a character, the instruction there is your A is going to be a character, and then B is whatever you want to do next with that character. And to show you that, we can now begin to encode the individual operations of our domain-specific language 
using the data type we've just introduced. So f open, uh, the witness that we're going to use there is we can witness any file path and we're going to begin in a closed state. And the continuation is going to be passed in a witness file handle state. Uh, and what witness file handle state is it's doing is it's not leaking any information of what state we're actually in, uh, in the types. The only way you can learn what state we're in is by pattern matching on the value that I give you, and you have to deal with every possible outcome then. However, get car, uh, char is a little bit more uh, refined. It witnesses no data to invoke this operation, uh, but you do have to be in an open file handle state. The continuation, however, is going to be past a witness that you are still in an open file handle state, and you can witness maybe a, a character there because you might be again in the file or not. And finally, for F close, we again witness no data in an open file handle state, and our continuation function will then witness no data, but it will see that we're now in a closed state. But each of these operations uh, is, is individual. We couldn't really build a program with any of these because they stand alone. They don't all have the same type. But we can combine them together by taking the sum of these data types. Uh, and this is something that Connor seems really fond of. You'll see this in a lot of his papers where he works with um, polynomial functions and so on. But the idea is you can combine functors together by basically saying it's either f or it's g, if you have two choices. And we can chain this up to say that a file handle operation is either an f open instruction or an f get char instruction or f get close. But this doesn't give us an ability to sequence operations together. All we've seen so far is we have the ability to do one of these operations and then do a pure computation we don't have the ability to do more side effect and computations. And to get that power, then we need a monad. Unfortunately, the data we've seen so far doesn't have a monad. So there is no way to sequence this stuff. But it's known in mathematics in general that there are free constructions where you can add just enough structure to an existing structure by adding just a couple more laws onto it, which uh, in this case, we can do that with free monads. So we can take any functor and we can enrich it with just enough information to get a monad out of it. Uh, and to do that, uh, we've got a data set here. I don't really want to go into the details of how you get the free construction out of it. There are really good tutorials online about that and uh, also Andreas Lowe has done a really good talk on free monads, which carries over to this as well. But the idea is you can take any functor and then you can turn it into a monad by using this free, mo free monad construction. Yep. Oh, yeah, that's meant to be pure, sorry. Yeah. So do I extend you have to pattern match on each of these? Oh, I see. And that's meant to be pure. Yeah. We'll see if that happens in any other slides. <laughs> uh, so now that we've got this free monad construction over any functor, we can take the free monad over our functor of file handle operations. And this now lets us start finally building some actual programs out of this stuff. So the open file instruction simply takes a file path and it's going to be an action in our file handle operation free monad. Uh, so here is the kind of return value of the monad, and over here on the right hand side is going to be the state that we expect to start in. So the types are a little kind of flipped around from what you might expect. Uh, but essentially, yeah, if you expect that the penultimate one is your return value, and then the very last one is the state that you have to start in. So opening the file takes a file path will deliver you a witness to file handle state that you don't necessarily know about, and it has to start in the closed file handle state. Getting a character, however, has to start in the open file handle state, and it will deliver you a witness that maybe contains a character and carries on witnessing that you're still in an open state, and we can do the same for uh, closed file. And these, the actual implementations of these aren't quite correct in that you do have to do a little bit more work, but I didn't really want to clutter this up. But the idea is we can take a single one of these operations which came from uh, this type, and then we simply have to lift that up into the monad. Uh, and the continuation in every case is just pure because we're not going to actually do anything with this value in each of these primitive operations. We'll start to manipulate the values as we begin to sequence things together using the monad. So we can now actually go back and look at our original kind of failing program and see how we can recast this in our more rigorous setting and deal with whatever the world happens to throw at us. 
So in the very first line, I said there was a problem that we assumed that the file handle would have been in an open state. But now we don't get that ability. What we have to do is when we call uh, f open, we have to use the demonic bind operator, in which case we now have to pattern match on the potential outcomes of opening that file handle. So there are two possible states we could be in. We could either witness that the file handle was successfully opened, or we can witness that the file handle was not successfully opened. Uh, and in both cases, we've now, we're now forced to consider what state we ended up in. If it did open, then we can do what we did before and enter a loop where we read the contents of the file. And uh, we'll see what the definition of loop is later, but that's going to witness that the file handle state doesn't change. So as we go over and over this loop, we'll remain in an open file state until we've read the entire contents of the file, in which case we have to close the file, and then we can witness the contents of the file that we read earlier. An F close here can't be left out, because we're saying here that we're going to return maybe a string, but we're going to end up in a closed state. So if I didn't close the file, we'd still be in an open state, and the program wouldn't touch it. However, if we do end up in a closed state when we originally open the file, then all I need to do is witness the nothing value, because we're already in that desired closing state. So for reading the contents of the file, we uh, have another little program here. And this one has to begin in an open file handle state. And it's going to deliver a string also in the open file handle state. And to do that, we again just use the angelic bind operation, reading a character repeatedly until uh, f gets c returns nothing, in which case we return our base case of an empty string. If we do read a character, then we can go back into a loop again, and then we basically have to map the character we've just read, oh, sorry, that should be c prime, over the contents of the string. So this is just a kind of basic recursive program that builds up a uh, string by reading the contents of a file. But there's also something interesting here, which is that there's no maybe in this typing. Uh, as long as all of our actual kind of specification assumptions hold, which is that getting a character really does keep the file handle open, then there's no way for this program to go wrong. We've already dealt with all of those scenarios earlier on. So when we combine the two together, we end up with a program that does have all of the assumptions that we started with encoded directly into the program. So the last step is we need a way to actually run this stuff. And to run these kind of programs, you have to basically run them down to primitive operations in a more primitive monad. And in the case of Haskell, that's running this down into the IO monad. And to write the interpreter is the same way you would write an interpreter for a free monad in general, which is to pattern match on all the possible operations that could happen. So uh, earlier we saw that a file handle operation was either opening a file getting a character or closing a file, so I need to pattern match on, either, on all of those. So to open a file, um, my pattern match here is going to witness a path, which is the file that I need to open, and then continue is that continuation of what I need to do next. So for the interpretation of this, I try and open the file, and I deal with any exceptions that might happen. And I can, uh, so try here is going to either give me the exception, or it's going to give me a file handle that's successfully opened. So I can pattern match on the result of opening a file. And if I got an exception, then I can continue witnessing that the file handle is in a closed state. However, if I witness that the file handle did successfully open, then I can do another type of interpretation using this open file handle. And now I get the ability to continue with file handle in an open state. And it's here again that that higher rank quantification is becoming useful because I'm able to pass two different types of data to a function because I've already ensured that that function can deal with whatever I choose to call it with. Uh, and for interpret open, we just basically have to follow the same pattern of pattern matching all the possible file handle operations. Uh, I'm not going to go into the detail of what that is, but the idea is that if you were given a, a get char operation, you've now got an open file handle, <coughs> so you can simply get a character, uh, and for closing a file handle, you can uh, just close the file handle. Uh, and also, it's, it's kind of worth noting that interpret itself chooses what these types have to be. You can only interpret programs that begin in a closed file handle state and end in a closed file handle state. There's no way to interpret a program that's going to leak file handle instructions. So that's most of the paper. There's actually more, but at this point I was feeling like I've probably thrown enough concepts at everyone. Uh, but you can also go a little further with this and kind of get applicative functors and some stuff out. And, um, Pattern synonyms out of this as well. 
But hopefully I've shown you that uh, just by having these state index data types and then gradually adding a little bit more structure to them in terms of index functors and index monads, we can really start to encode some pretty tricky logic into our programs. So we borrowed the ideas of category theory and we got these notions of composition almost without having to do any work. We kind of just transcribed the definitions directly into the types we had uh, and we were able to work with them. And then we used some generic programming techniques to do as little work as possible to get to a domain specific language for working with file handles and reading from file handles. And then we saw how to actually get this stuff to do something useful by writing an interpreter over this to let us actually run these programs. So that's the kind of main essence of that paper, but it, for me it left me with a lot of open questions of what comes next. We've seen there that we've got uh, monads that work with reading a single file handle at a time. But again, in reality, programs are more complicated than that. You read multiple file handles at times, and you may be changed between all sorts of different states. So when I spoke to Connor and said, well, you know, how do I get to do all of the stuff that I really want to do out of this, he pointed me to even more research. So what comes next is work on index containers and the separation logic. And uh, for me, the journey there really continues. So, the paper has already given me some good ideas on how to start getting the logic I want, but there's a lot more work to do. So, that's, yeah, that's most, most of what I wanted to talk about. It's probably a ton there that I've gone through really quickly, so I'm happy to jump around this and go over things if people are still a little unclear on stuff. We've got time for questions, please fire away. I have two questions. Mm -hmm. did, so, so when you first used it, did you, did you use she or did you, you just transcribe the, the data kinds exist? The, the, the paper is written using she, yeah. the strapline has an enhancement suite. Um, but since then we've got data kind promotion. I think it's really data kind promotion is the only thing you need, and yeah. also patents in it. So um, when I first read the paper, I mean, I wasn't even trying to take the ideas. I was just trying to get through the paper and get some of the ideas out. And now that I'm trying to apply these ideas in actual work stuff, I'm using data kind promotion and not the enhancement suite. Did you use maybe um, singleton types for that? Yeah. Thing as data points? Yeah, yeah. So um, what we've actually got uh, way earlier on with that witness FH state data type, this is actually a singleton for the file handle state type. So again, yeah, uh, that's Richard Eisenberg's work. And you could, again, avoid having to write some of this stuff and get a bit closer to dependency type programming, how it looks in things like interest and active with the symptoms library. Yeah, when you have your polymorphic types um, for all state, uh, what does it range over? Uh, so you mean things like that kind of yes. stuff? Uh, in this case, it's <coughs> polymorphic over any type. Uh, okay. So that doesn't use any kind of kind polymorphism or anything there. Uh, there are other places where... What is your state? So, uh, however, in, in things like this, though, the range is a little bit more restricted. Um, actually, it's this one it's more restricted. These have to quantify over types of the same kind, but not necessarily the types. Would I run into trouble rather than thinking of a slight category of thinking of the colon arrow as a natural transformation and then thinking of a higher order? Well, it, yeah, so it is a natural transformation, but I think, so I'm still trying to run with the idea of it being a slice category and seeing exactly what that gives me. But I've found that feels a little bit more straightforward in terms of getting composition and stuff out of it because, I mean, natural transformations do form a category anyway. Yeah, yeah, I'm saying you, you, you're then in a higher order category, so. yeah. <laughs> still a way away for me to understand. Yeah. So I think maybe working with slice categories is a kind of, I already know how to work with basic yeah. categories, so a slice category feels a little bit more familiar. <coughs> yeah, uh, this is more of a troll with a question. But didn't Java achieve this with checked exceptions? <laughs> uh, well, I never used Java's checked exceptions, so I haven't had the luxury of writing Java in my past. <laughs> um, in, in the sense that you've now got to kind of deal with everything and it becomes tedious. Yes, saying that, that that could be a problem, but here we're, we're, we're 
we're choosing to put ourselves in a situation where we do want that level of um, precision. So, I mean, I'm not actually using all of these concepts in any of my work. I've kind of been inspired by the paper to pick and choose the bits I need. So occasionally I will want higher end quantification just to deal with a bit of uncertainty and stuff. Um, I don't use the full kind of domain-specific language approach. So you could have one program where in part of the program you're using this stuff. Absolutely, and yeah. And the other part you just don't care. Yeah, because I mean what you're doing right at the end there with that uh, interpreter is you end up in I O. So if I if I have a place where I need this precision and it really can't go wrong, then I can I can use my uh, domain specific language. But then I can escape that by going back down to I O whenever I need to. Describe what we're doing in, in the, from a Caspi theory point of view. Is this the DSL for, for dealing with, with slice categories? Uh, so the slice category is, is just a way of talking about what types we're working with and stuff. Uh, it's, I mean, you'd normally slice over the category of Haskell functions and types. Here you're slicing over a kind of one level higher where you're slicing over the kinds of types. I don't know if you're familiar with Haskell's kind of hierarchy of types. <laughs> so it has a kind of hierarchy where you have values which have types and then types have kinds. So the slice category is working over that kind of type that's slice. So slicing over a higher kind of type. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you're indexing via kinds. I always think of this the slice category is like the slice of things that you've got your S at the bottom. So, so it is that's, that's the slice. That's the yeah, sure, I know what's happening. Yeah, yeah. They're kind of sliced over the values of the type because those values are raised and are lifted to types of well, you, Yeah, you could slice over either. In this case, we're slicing over types of kinds because that's that's kind of where the real important stuff is in terms of the logic and stuff, yeah. But I, I should probably say that the, the slice category is something that that's kind of this year's research goal for me is to get more familiar with exactly how this relates to slice categories in general. I've found a little bit more research. I think there's a paper called the, uh, the Topological Construction of Programs or something like that, which also looks at this. And all I've managed to get out of Quantum McBride when I asked for advice is small tweet replies. So there's not much information to go on, but I'm gradually getting there. So unfortunately, I can't give a good description of the slice and comma categories that are in play here, other than there is some that, I think. Okay, if that's all the questions we have, um, thank you very much, Ollie. Thanks. So, you're free to hang around here for a bit longer. Um, I'd appreciate some help, you know, just from a couple of people to put the chairs away. Um, just, I'll direct people in a minute. Um, after that, we'll be going to the Sheaf, which is a pub around the corner towards London Bridge Station. Um, uh, please make sure all the rubbish is taken away, put bins, and uh, please eat all the pizza. It's going to go to waste otherwise. Um, and thank you all for coming.